Well, hello, and thank you for joining me today. Now, I've got a very special guest who's joining via audio today. We've had some camera issues, but it's a very, very important conversation that I think a lot of people here are going to resonate with and find some very interesting practical solutions for problems that you suffer with every day. We're talking about the connection between your teeth and how your dental arch forms and how you breathe. To speak to, speak to us today about this is Professor Dave Singh. Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good to uh, see you again. Yeah, so it, it's been a few years since we've talked, but you've been a very busy man. The your your work has spanned you know many decades now, looking into how the airway and how it connects into how our dental arch forms. Just to help the listeners understand where you started in this, can you just can you just let us know how you first began to look at how the dental arch forms and how it connects to the airway. What, what were some of those first steps in? Well, I guess uh, the story starts when I uh, did my PhD, which is in cleft palate formation. And so kids who are born with a hair lip or a cleft palate, that was my first real kind of uh, adventure into how the entire mid face, how it forms, how it functions, and you know how kind of complex it is um, and going on from there, that actually led me on to airway, breathing, and sleep. Um, that's a span of about, you know, 20 years, which means I'm getting a little bit old. <laughs> but, you know, you, you're, you're talking about an area that has really spanned a long time in terms of how it, how it is kind of spread out in terms of what we've learned in terms of research. And you've really been at the coalface in terms of this. What were some of those early studies that, that, that led you into the area of thinking about um, you know, how our dental life affects the airway? You know, that's a really good question, Steve. And so if you think about babies and children who are born with, you know, like a hair lip or a cleft palate, because we are obviously human, we have facial recognition. We recognize a human face. And when we see a baby with a cleft lip or a cleft palate, our, our eyes immediately are drawn to the deformity, the fact that this lip uh, hasn't really formed properly or the palate hasn't formed properly. The major issue for the baby actually is different. The baby's issue is I want to be able to feed through my mouth and be able to breathe through my nose. And so the idea was to say if we can improve nasal breathing in these babies, in these children, how would the face grow after that correction? And the second question was, can we do that nasal correction without using surgery, using the baby's own growth and development? And the long story short is that, you know, we spent a good five, 10 years on that project. And we came with some pretty remarkable kind of uh, results to say that we can probably get these little babies as they grow into children to be able to breathe through their noses. It's a remarkable um, idea that we can change the way the dental arch forms and, and how that affects you know, so, something as important as breathing. The idea that you know, we can change this in children has become a little bit more um, better known in the last few years, but in terms of changing our, our dental arch and, and shifting our airway in adults. This isn't so well known. Can you help describe what the conventional viewpoint is on what happens when our, our arch forms and then what we can do about it if there is an airway dysfunction? Well, that's a great question, Steve. And so, you know, the, the older ideas, the original ideas is that, you know, as you become an adult, the growth mechanisms in the palate and in the middle part of the face, they slow down and eventually stop. Now, those specific sites are called sutures. And so if you look inside the a human palate, there's a whole system of sutures. And these sutures actually go right around the mid face and actually extend all the way into the human skull. And so we have to think about the idea of why would we have these sutures and the idea, of course, is to say that they will permit facial growth and development. So that was the original idea. 
Now, technology keeps on moving. We get new techniques and we can start to look at old questions in a different way. And when we started looking at these sutures, even in adult patients, we found that there were populations of stem cells. Now, stem cells are pretty important because they allow other tissues to be formed. That tissue could be, you know, muscle, it could be bone, it could be any array of tissues. As long as you have a population of stem cells, those cells can grow and develop. And so the new idea is, uh, well, if an adult patient has a population of stem cells in the palate or in the midface or elsewhere, would we be able to communicate with those cells and allow the growth and development to proceed um, to some extent, not to the same extent as a child or a teenager, for example, the, the whole idea was to say, can we permit some degree of renewed growth and development, even in adult cases, without using surgery, without using drugs? And the surprising answer is it may well be possible in quite a broad range of adults. And this is a huge um, it's a huge concept in terms of, you know, how we perceive the, um, you know, the, the malleability of our, of our, of our craniofacial form and, and how we interact with our environment, which is, which is breathing. The, there was a, a, a really big um, kick up in the, the area of epigenetics and how at the environment impacts on our, our DNA and genes. And, and was, was this something that impacted your work um, as you were looking, you know, where, where did that kind of all start to, to connect in when you started to think about craniofacial epigenetics? This is fascinating. Uh, well, again, very well uh, asked and posed, Steve. So, you know, we see further by standing on the shoulders of giants. In other words, before we started our careers, there was pioneers in the field who set the tone and set the vision in terms of what might be possible in the future. So this brings us to epigenetics. So originally the idea was, you know, the genes are going to determine the outcome. And that was based on the work by, you know, Mendel and Darwin and all those great people who were looking at how genes are expressed and inherited, which is great. But what we were finding is that if we take two identical twins who have got exactly the same genes, as they start to grow older, they start to look more and more different. You know, their facial form seems to diverge. And the only way you can explain that is to say there must have been an environmental influence. So, you know, you won't change, you know, green eyes to blue eyes, but you might take a narrow uh, face and make it a little bit broader. You might take a lower jaw and make it slightly more robust. And so those subtle changes are probably epigenetic in nature. So let's go all the way back to when I was a student and reading the papers by, you know, um, Professor Melvin Moss over at uh, Columbia University in New York and those kinds of people. And they just hinted that there's probably an epigenetic phenomenon. But of course, those kinds of people retired before you and I actually got onto the scene. And so what we did is was to look at the original ideas using the new techniques, molecular biology, molecular genetics, the digital, you know, um, techniques that we have, the 3D scanning and the 3D imaging, revisit the ideas and come up with a slightly different solution. Of course, there's a huge amount of work to be done, but actually epigenetics is a very well uh, respected, you know, a medical specialty you know, today it's still young, but it's made huge strides. And so I think we have a good base uh, on which to build. You know, people talk about epigenetics in terms of how we put food in our mouth and, you know, other environmental inputs. But there's the, the idea, I remember, it was one at one of your lectures uh, of how we, um, how we can influence even the, the bony structures of our face really changed the way I viewed, um, you know, not only, you know, my patients, um, you know, jaws and faces, but also, you know, my, my view on the, the human condition that we really are in the driver's seat here if we see it that way and, and you know, our bony structure can be shifted. So I think it's a really powerful idea and I love how you've strung that together. And it, 
when we apply it to a, a problem which is as um, prevalent as airway dysfunction, you know, this, this, we're really talking about a solution here that could, you know, cause, could help many, many people. So it's, it's fascinating to see these things tying together. And I love the way that you, you bring it together and, and that we, we can start to apply this in a clinical, um, clinical way. So to, to help people kind of understand the, the scope of what, how people, how we can change um, clinical aspects, Tell us a little bit about the um, the research out there in terms of what people are suffering with airway dysfunction. You know, what are what are the um, you know the the big uh, problems that people are suffering with with their airways, and how can we start to think of this in more of a craniofacial epigenetic um, sense? Well, again, uh, a great question. So we've got to be a little bit careful here because airway is a huge word, medically speaking because the airway starts you know, at the nose, at the nostrils. It goes all the way down your breathing tube, your trachea, and it goes all the way down to your lungs. So the airway itself is a pretty complex and diverse structure. And we have specialists, uh, pulmonologists, respiratory medicine, so on and so forth, who are gonna really focus on airway health. So now the question is, well, how does the dental profession get involved in that type of medical work? And the answer is quite simple, is that, you know, the top jaw is the floor, if you will, of the, of the nose, which is the nasal airway. And then behind the palate and the tongue, you've got, you know, the oral airway. And then below that, you've got, you know, the, the kind of the upper part of the airway. And so all of the dental structures, the upper jaw, the lower jaw, the tongue, the teeth, all of those components are going to have a direct or indirect effect on the upper airway. And that region is, you know, examined and cared for by the dental profession pretty specifically, you know? And so that's how we get into that part of the discussion. However, we can't look at airway in isolation. It has to be done in terms of airway, breathing and sleep. So let's say the airway in terms of its structure, we've got people who look at it, you know, in terms of asthma, uh, bronchitis, um, you know, snoring, all of these things come into airway. But we have to think about, all right, what about breathing? Because you can breathe through your mouth and you can also breathe through your nose. And the question is, is there a difference? And the answer is, there's a huge difference. So we would love for most people, most of the time, to be breathing through their noses. If you take a young baby at birth, they are obligate nasal breathers. So not only do we need to look at the airway, we need to look at, say, how are you using various different parts of the airway and are you using them the way that nature intended? And then part three is, let's say you're not using the airway you know, in the most optimal way. So what, what's the consequences? Well, the consequences involve sleep because during sleep, you have automated breathing, you're in a relaxed state, the body, the muscles are relaxed. You're in a parasympathetic type of situation where, you know, rest, relaxation, rejuvenation, recovery, all of that great stuff happens during sleep. But if the airway doesn't behave well during sleep, then sleep is disrupted. And sleep disruption, that is a major medical concern. Now, if we take sleep, well, we've we'll got a specialty of sleep medicine. So sleep in itself, there's a whole group of medical physicians who will say, I specialize in sleep. So sleep involves things like, you know, insomnia, where some people find it difficult to sleep. Um, sleep involves things like, you know, narcolepsy, where people fall asleep maybe at the wrong time of day. And so we'd be very careful in the sense of what does the dental profession do? It's a very focused and saying, I'm going to be looking after the patient's airway so they can breathe optimally whilst they are asleep. So it's like a bit of a, a mosaic, it's a pattern, it's a jigsaw puzzle. Very specialties working together can produce really good outcomes. And that includes the dental profession, which is why we're so excited about getting this message through to the general public to know that 
there may be some solutions that don't come to mind when you think about airway, breathing and sleep. How would a dentist be involved there? And this is part of today's discussion. Absolutely. And the, um, you know, the whole concept of a multidisciplinary team has been kind of popping up and popping up. And it really is coming to the forefront now that, you know, the, there are powerful things we can do for patients if we understand that the whole body works together and something is as critical as breathing is and airway and sleep is inter interconnected. So it, it's it's such a, a powerful concept for not only um, patients, but also, also to change practitioners' lives too. So it's it's a, it's very important that people see that this, there's this connection that we can work together in that sense. Dave, you mentioned snoring, um, but the 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 breadth of um, of dysfunction during sleep isn't always you know just snoring, is it? it are there other dental um, symptoms or signs of airway dysfunction that a dentist can potentially pick up and maybe refer off um, besides just the, the scale of snoring? Well, absolutely. And the reason I mentioned that is because it's a commonly known um, symptom. If you look at any culture throughout the world, whether it's in Asia, Europe, you know, Africa, North America, wherever you go, every culture has a word for snoring, which means that it's a human condition. It's universal and it's been there a long time. So that's one of the most common ones that we know about because it's kind of obvious, although the patient who is snoring doesn't know that they're snoring unless they're told by someone else, hey, you were snoring last night. So now you have to think about what could I, as a patient, pick up myself that someone else might not pick up. And one of the things is like tooth grinding, bruxism, and clenching so that the teeth are actually worn away. And so what happens during sleep is that if the airway collapses and you're not breathing, there's a flight or fight response, wake up and take a breath. And that stress is related to a brux or a clench or a grind. So a little bit of the tooth tissue is actually worn away when you're grinding and bruxing during sleep. Now that happens both in children and in adults. So a little baby child, you know, young child, three, four, five years old, who is sleeping, the parents just need to observe, is it silent and friction-free sleep? Because babies and children, young children, should not be making any noises when they are asleep. And so, you know, you might notice that a child's teeth are being worn away. Well, if they're baby teeth, they are going to wear away because they're going to be replaced by, you know, the adult teeth later. But in an adult, if you've got tooth wear, and it's kind of significant, you know, the patient might go to the dentist saying that my teeth are sensitive to hot or to cold or that kind of idea. And what a dentist might find is bruxism has, called a has caused the teeth to wear away. The underlying tissues have been exposed and they're sensitive to heat and, you know, drinks and ice, that kind of stuff. So don't be surprised if you go to a dentist and saying this tooth wear is actually related to your behavior during sleep and that's the underlying issue that we have to address so there's many many uh, conditions that are related to indirectly to sleep that the dentist or dental professional can pick up i'll just give you another one in passing and you know dentists and orthodontists you know we take photographs facial photographs of the patient from the front when they're smiling from the side and sometimes what you see is like a double chin. And so that double chin represents obesity. Now, most people will pick up obesity. You know, you've got a big waistline or you're a heavy person. But that can actually extend onto into the neck and underneath the jaw. And that deposit of fat tissue, what it, what it can do is put pressure, tissue pressure on the airway when you lie down and sleep and cause airway obstruction. And so we need to think about nutrition, um, we need to think about lifestyle, all of that stuff comes in to say, how would this accumulate, aggregate, and maybe lead to a diagnosis of something like sleep apnea? And so there's so many different ways that we start to pick up 
this underlying condition. And I've just talked about some of the kind of, you know, facial features like, you know, facial appearance and tooth wear and snoring. But there's a whole host of medical symptoms which suddenly come into the equation, um, which, you know, are picked up either by the dentist or by the medical profession. That was my next question. If, if do you do you have a um, what have you found in terms of um, your uh, your clinical observations in terms of what kind of other problems do people suffer from? So say that they you know they might be um, they, they might have a suspicion they're grinding their teeth. What other areas in their body or conditions should they be watching out out for? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question because we have been recently talking to our cardiologist colleagues and they are intrigued by what happens when you go for a dental checkup because it's not unusual for the dentist now to take a blood pressure reading or recording at a dental appointment. And we've done that historical, historically for so many different reasons. What we don't do as dentists or as orthodontists, what we do not do is we don't diagnose hypertension or any other type of cardiovascular issue. But if we take a reading in the dental office and it has a high blood pressure, we're gonna refer that patient to a cardiologist or a physician to check out to find out why does this patient have high blood pressure. And what the studies show is there's a very high likelihood that if you have a diagnosis of hypertension, high blood pressure, that sort of thing, the next thing to do, one of the things that we need to do is take a sleep study to find out if you have a diagnosis of sleep apnea. And so the reason why that's so important is because hypertension is associated with, you know, heart attack, heart failures, um, strokes, um, all of those very major medical issues. And if we can prevent a stroke, if we can prevent a heart attack, if we can reduce the severity of the stroke or the heart attack, or we can push it downstream by five years, 10 years, the quality of, that, of the quality of life of that patient is going to improve dramatically. This is where the dental profession has an edge on our medical colleagues because we tend to see patients on a more regular basis and more frequently throughout the year. And so we can pick up changes, you know, in weight or behavior or signs or symptoms, and then, you know, collaborate with our medical colleagues to say, what is the working diagnosis here? What, what is actually going on systemically with this patient's health? So other things to think about are things like diabetes. Now, again, to the dental profession, it's well known that if some people have kind of really poor gum health, there may be an underlying condition um, or association with diabetes. The dentist might be the first person to pick up a possible screening of diabetes. And so diabetes, again, is a condition that is associated with sleep apnea. And so we can go on and on to find out how the dentist can start screening, advising a patient, you know, preventing some of these issues from happening. And if we do find this, you know, a medical condition, we can refer them to our dental, to our medical colleagues, and start to um, get some form of treatment going. It's a powerful connection, and, and you, it seems so um, so simple when you describe it. But it, out in society, it is something that we've had disconnected for quite some time now. So, it, it's a concept that really would change a lot of people's lives if we can help to give these earlier signposts. You know, so that people can get a quick diagnosis and get effective treatment. So. Really important stuff. They, I was just, I was going to ask for people trying to understand or suspecting they have an airway issue. What are some of the screening uh, methods or uh, the 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 ways that a, a dental practitioner can help to understand what is happening in the airway? Can you help describe people um, to, to describe to people how this is happening and how we can measure what is happening in the airway? Well, there's the several techniques. Some can be used for children, some can be used for adults, some can be used for both. And it depends what you have available. So let's take the simplest form, the most and least invasive. That would be a straight questionnaire. So let's take a child, you know, who comes to the dental office and, you know, the dentist is going through the medical history. And let's say the parent says, you know, my child is still, you know, bedwetting, has accidents, you know, maybe during the day or during the night. 
even though they are, you know, eight years old. I'm just giving an example. So bedwetting in a child is a kind of one of those features thinking, I wonder why this is happening, okay? And so what we can do is a pediatric sleep questionnaire. It's just a simple uh, series of questions that we ask to find out what is the likelihood, low, moderate, or high, what is the risk of this child having undiagnosed sleep apnea? And so we can go through the pediatric sleep questionnaire, and based on the findings, we're going to say there may be a low risk or maybe a high risk of this child having sleep apnea. So if we reach that conclusion, the next thing to do is say we need to do a overnight sleep study. And so here is where you have to think about what equipment is available, either to do it in the parent's home, in the child's home, in their own you know, sleeping environment, or do we have to refer out to a sleep clinic where the child will stay overnight and we do a full-blown sleep study? Now, again, it varies from place to place. So some of the home sleep studies that are done in children can you know, rule out or they can you know, confirm the suspicion of sleep apnea. But if those two things don't match, and what I mean by that is if the symptoms that the parent and the child are talking about don't match the findings of the home sleep study, then that child will be referred to a sleep clinic, maybe in a hospital or a university hospital, something like that, where they'll do the full-blown PSG polysomnography, which is done you know, with a lot of channels to rule out the fact that this child does or does not have sleep apnea. Now, for adults, it's slightly different because some of the home sleep studies now, the technology is so good that you can probably use that for a diagnosis of sleep apnea by doing a home sleep study in an adult. The difference here is that dentists are not permitted to diagnose any sleep issues. But if the dentist is going to be able to provide the sleep study, then the sleep study outcome will be interpreted by the medical physician to say, this adult patient has mild, moderate, or severe sleep apnea. And so one of the ways to say, do you have a diagnosis of sleep apnea, is to do a sleep study. Now, we can do a step prior to that in case that you're not quite sure. You're saying, I'm, I'm wondering, is this a borderline case? You know, the signs and symptoms don't really add up. So what you can do also is do a 3D scan, a 3D CD scan um, of the head and neck region of a patient in a dental office. And then we can take that scan and start looking at the features of the airway. Is the airway narrow? Does it have a small surface area? Does it have a low volume? Now you can't diagnose sleep issues from the scan, but again, it's gonna add information to say, if this patient has got, you know, a small or obstructed airway, there's a higher chance that they may have undiagnosed sleep apnea, and therefore you would do a sleep study to confirm that, and the sleep study would be read by a physician to actually give you the working diagnosis. So those are two kind of major ways that you could start looking at patients to say, do you have a high risk of sleep apnea? Um, there are other methods as well, and they are changing, you know, periodically from time to time. New techniques are being, um, you know, uh, being uh, validated. So those are the two major ways that we can start looking to see, does a patient have, you know, sleep apnea, which has been undiagnosed so far. Let's, let's start to, because um, the, the CBCT is something that is becoming a little bit more uh, common and people are getting um, uh, through their dentists. Can you help us to understand what is what we're, we're looking at in CBCT in terms of the, you mentioned volume and surface area. So what's happening um, when we think about the, um, we're measuring both what's happening with the dental arch and, and the surface area and volume of the airway? Well, you know, the, the 3D scan, CD scan, the CBT scan that you mentioned is an extremely powerful tool in the right hands. And so we have to have standardization of the imaging. So we can compare before, after, you know, with a patient who has 
does not have sleep apnea with a patient who does have sleep apnea. So you can start at the very top and start looking at the nasal airway. We can measure, you know, the volume of the nasal airway. We can measure the surface area behind the nose to see where the airflow goes before it goes down, you know, the back of the throat. Um, and so we start getting some pretty nice um, data from that. And some university hospitals, what they've done is they produce data sets for us to refer to, to say, this would be a normal range. So for example, let's take children. We know that the airway is going to change as this patient starts to grow and develop. And so there's a chart showing you that at this age, this is the kind of volume we expect. At a certain age, you know, it will change. And about the age of about, you know, 18, 21, the airway starts to stabilize in volume. And then after the age of about, you know, 40, 45, it starts to decrease slightly in volume. And so here's the most important factor is standardization of where was the measurement taken, at what level was it taken. So we can take that volume measurement, compare it against a standard graph to say, you know, you've got a normal airway or it's a bit on the, bit on the low side, um, that kind of thing. So we can measure volumes, we can measure surface areas. And again, there are standards which are in the published literature which show you that if you measure an airway volume and it's less than 120 millimeters squared, for example, that might be, re might be seen as being on the small side. In other words, as increased airway resistance, decreased airway flow, increased chance of airway collapse during sleep. And remember that these measurements are taken during the daytime, and we know that the airway changes its behavior when you sleep, and so again, you can't diagnose from a single measurement from the cow beam, but it's a really good way of gauging how close you are to what we would call a normal airway to one that is kind of constricted or restricted. Um, and then the other thing to think about is, um, you know, how the airway is going to behave because children, they have a smaller airway by definition. But of course, surrounding the airway, is a group of muscles. Now, these muscles are not under our control. They're under the autonomic nervous system, which means they can relax and they can tense, you know, due to other mechanisms. Um, so in children, the airway muscle tone tends to be higher, which means that even though the airway is smaller, less chance for it to collapse. You have an adult with a very large airway but if the muscle tone is low, there's probably an increased chance of collapse. Let's go back to children. If we look at the airway in children, some children have big tonsils, big adenoids, which are actually physically blocking the airway. We take an adult patient by the age of about 16, those tonsils would typically regress completely and not cause any airway obstruction. So we get so much information from the 3D cone beam scans. It's wonderful. However, we have to balance that with the functional parameters. What is the, you know, airway behavior during sleep to say whether this patient has sleep apnea or not? And so really it's a combination of factors to get a working diagnosis. And Dave, in, in your, um, your recent um, your work, uh, you've just published a textbook based on, you know, all the, your clinical uh, um, experience with, uh, with, with Vivos and, um, and the research prior to that. But you, you've, you've, you've used the term pneumopedics. And so what, can you tell us about what, I mean, I think you were describing this whole connection here, but tell us how you came to that, that word in, to describe this whole connection between training facial growth and breathing. Well, you know, because technology moves and we have new findings and we start to get new concepts being developed. So let's take a well-established, um, you know, protocol, orthodontics. Ortho means, you know, straight and dontics is teeth. So orthodontics is straightening the teeth, improving the teeth. Um, we understand that. Let's take another example, orthopedics. Pedics typically refers to bone and bone remodeling. So orthopedics is actually surgical or maybe non-surgical bone remodeling. 
and now we think about pneumo so pneumo refers to the air so pneumonia for example is an airway disease so pneumo and then pedics which is really remodeling pneumopedics becomes airway remodeling and so we want to describe the what we see based on our observation based on our measurements and consistently and reliably let's take a couple of examples common examples one of which is um we'll just take asthma asthma is a well-known airway disease and what we know is that the airway undergoes physical structural changes which are described as remodeling because of the nature of the disease of asthma similarly if you look at the nose people with rhinitis uh, allergies nasal allergies that part of the airway also undergoes remodeling during you know a long-term chronic pa patient with rhinitis then is where we undergo remodeling. And so what that tells us is that there is a mechanism that exists in the body to allow the airway structure to be changed, either beneficially or in the cases I've just described in a detrimental fashion. So let's take that as a starting point and remember that stem cells have been isolated in almost every part of the airway from the nose right down to the lungs. And now we have to think about what if we were able to somehow get those stem cells working in our favor to remodel the airway so we can breathe and sleep better, you know, at night. And so this is a novel idea. It's a new idea. It's gaining, you know, uh, more and more support as time goes on. And so this is the nature of medical research is that you come across a finding, an observation, you try to develop that into a protocol, then you test it to see, is it safe? Is it effective? Is it something that can be applied to the population in general? And so you can regard this as the first step in a pretty long journey. But so far, uh, we're optimistic and pretty hopeful in terms of where we will go with this. So we're beginning to describe this this way that a patient can walk into an office, they can describe some symptoms associated with sleep, you know, a, a dental practitioner, or maybe they're referred from a medical practitioner to find out what's, you know, what's happening in the mouth. And there, there might be some oral symptoms, you know, they may or may not pick up um, a sleep disorder, but can you, and, and sorry, so the, the testing, so we can begin to, to measure the volume and the, and the airway um, it, itself and the surface area, sorry. But so, can you help to describe what you you um, you pen as biomimetic oral appliances? How can these begin to interface and change the airway? And what have you seen um, in in your clinics? And and how does this begin to apply in the patient sense? Well, you know, biomimetics is a a big topic. It's uh, getting a huge amount of uh, attention these days. So biomimetics essentially is you are mimicking nature. You're copying nature. And so if you take uh, robotics, you know, people are now engineering, bioengineering limbs and various other body parts that are used as implants or adjuncts. You can have structures that are implanted into the eye, into the joints, uh, so on and so forth. And so biomimetics is I'm going to replicate and copy the natural design, you know, um, and we can take that as a general principle and then focus right in and say, okay, how would that apply to the dental profession? Well, one very obvious way is biomimetic dentistry. And what that means is we are using dental materials which mimic dental tissues. So let's say a patient needs a filling and in the good old days, you know, you would do an amalgam filling, silver amalgam filling. And we found out later that, you know, it's probably not the best material. It's not a bad material, but it's probably not the best. And so what the research did was to develop and identify materials that mimic the behavior of enamel, that mimic the behavior of dentine, so on and so forth. And so you can restore a tooth with a material that behaves like tooth tissue. Now we take that idea and expand it a little bit further and saying, how about a device 
or an, an appliance that you wear inside your mouth that mimics the way the jaws grow and develop. And so here we are doing, you know, the general term uses things like palatal expansion and, you know, repositioning the mandible, which is the lower jaw. So the idea is maybe the, the mid face, the upper jaw didn't grow and develop as well as it should. And what is the test for that? Well, the test for that is very simple, that your tongue should actually be sitting in your palate when you are at rest. And that includes when you are asleep. So if you wake up in the morning and your tongue is not sitting on your palate, it makes you wonder whether you had a refreshing, good night's sleep. So we can look at the tongue and we can kind of estimate the width of the tongue. And then we can measure the width of the upper jaw and say, is that palate wide enough to accommodate that tongue? And if it isn't, can we use a device to remodel that palate, remodel the upper jaw to get the tongue to sit there. Now, again, the tongue doesn't exist in isolation because your tongue actually is attached to your bottom jaw, to your lower jaw. So if the tongue comes upwards and sits in the palate and is able to do so, the lower jaw will come forwards, downwards and forwards at the same time. And what that does is it opens the airway behind the tongue and behind the lower jaw. So this is the biomimetic approach where you're saying the design already exists in nature. What I'm going to do is use a couple of devices to mimic that behavior, try to remodel that, you know, palate and that mid face and reposition that jaw. The tongue can sit in the palate. And if we can replicate that behavior on a daily basis, we will be breathing and sleeping like a regular person for the first time. And that has been our clinical experience, you know, to date. That's what we've been able to do. And so this is why it's exciting is because we're actually harnessing natural developmental mechanisms in the body to allow it to kind of heal itself. Now, remember, is that the tongue is a muscle and muscles have got memory. So let's take a child. The child actually has to learn how to walk. They have to learn how to run. They have to learn how to sprint. The muscles are there, the bones are there, but there's a learning curve to say, this is how I walk, this is how I run, and this is how I sprint. And funnily enough, the tongue and the jaw muscles are no different. So even though you've got a very nice, well-developed upper dental arch, it doesn't mean the tongue's gonna go there unless you train it to go there. And now the great thing is sometimes that happens automatically and spontaneously, which is wonderful. But if it doesn't, we need to put into an exercise routine into place to make sure that you learn this behavior. And once that live behavior has been learned, it becomes automatic. It becomes autonomic. And therefore, you know, you're in a good stable position. And so it's not just about expanding the power. It's not just about moving the mandible forward is to build instability into the system so then you have, you know, a long-term effect and not just a short-term, you know, uh, solution there. It's really a testament to the term biomimetic when we think about, you know, changing, you know, the or potentially assisting the structures of the jaw to be, um, you know, to, to be as in the dimensions that they are. Um, they're meant to be, but then getting the soft tissues to support this for the long term as well. And that really is the, you know, the, the challenge for both practitioner and patient in this space that there is this battle between both, um, you know, the, the structure and then how do we help the, the soft tissues to support this posture long term. Prof Singh, can you, can you help us to, to understand the dimensions in which we can change and what the virus appliance does in terms of changing the different dimensions of, of the jaw and how this affects the airway? Well, dimensions is a wonderful term and we can kind of uh, break that down into size, shape and position. So size, you know, we can measure size, how long is something, how broad is something, how deep is something. And we do that routinely, we make all of these measurements. And that's showing us, you know, things like, you know, surface area and volume, like we mentioned. So that's part of it. So we can say, you know, the palate got wider, 
But as it got wider, the actual volume of the bone increased because you just didn't do it in isolation. Um, so that's part one. But number two is shape. And this is critical for behavior. So we think, hey, we've got a nice wide palate. Everything should be hunky-dory. But you've got to think about behavior, clinical behavior. And I'll give you an example here. Let's take a dice, you know, a, the, you know, the dice that you throw and you go through the casino or whatever. So you've got a dice here and the dice have got a certain volume which you can measure. Now think of a marble. The marble has got exactly the same volume. It's the same size, but it's completely a different shape. So when you roll the dice and you roll the marble, the marble obviously is going to go a lot further because of the shape information. And so when air goes through the nose, it goes through the airway, you might have a huge big airway there, but the shape will say, this is how the air will behave. Are you going to get turbulent flow? Are you going to get laminar flow? Are you going to get a combination? Because when air goes through your nose, it's not just the size of the nose or the nasal airway, but it's the shape inside. And so nasal airway is very uh, kind of interesting and complex because we want to smell what we are breathing. So when the air actually goes into the nose, first thing is it goes up into the olfactory region and we say, wow, there's roast beef for dinner. You know, you get the aroma, you get the, the, uh, the smell sensation. And then after that, the air will pass past the sinuses, flow, laminar flow past the sinuses into the airway. Now, why are the sinuses important? Again, this comes back to size, that the, the upper jaw has got a volume. But that upper jaw is not completely built of, um, is not completely built of, any kind of uh, bony structure, in fact, what it has is the sinuses inside of it, which are filled with air. So this is very interesting because now you've got a wide palate and a bigger upper jaw, increased volume, but inside of that volume, you've got two big sinuses. The sinuses are lined with cells that produce nitric oxide. So when the air is flowing through the nose, it goes past the sinuses it picks up the nitric oxide, and that nitric oxide is delivered right down to the lungs. So nitric oxide is, you know, the magic bullet, if you will, because when it gets right down to the capillary level in the lungs, it will enhance oxygenation of the blood. It actually allows, you know, the blood to take up more oxygen from the lungs, and that's how you get healthy sleep. And so... When you think about the structure, you've got to think about behavior. How is it actually behaving? So we talked about size. We talked about the shape. And then the third thing is position, location. So let's take the lower jaw now. Let's say your lower jaw is recessed. It's set too far back. It's impinging on the airway, which means the airway will be kind of squished and a bit narrow. But if you bring that jaw forwards, you open up the airway and you permit airflow. There's some very elegant physics that we can talk about. Poiseuille's equation talks about how the radius of a tube is going to affect the flow of the air through the tube. And so simple procedure, bring the mandible forward, bring the lower jaw forwards, get a bigger airway radius, and now we've got better airflow. So the position of the mandible really does matter as well. And the position of the mandible is dependent on the position of the upper jaw because these two guys are twins separated at birth. And so the mandible, the, the lower jaw, will take information and signals from the top jaw. The top jaw will take signals from the cranial base, which is, you know, the bone above your eyebrows going all the way back. And so this is a pretty complex system, but it's set up for success and for health and survivability. And so our idea is to say, let's see if we can enhance that structure uh, the best we can um, to help, you know, in terms of human health. In terms of someone uh, that is, say that we're, they're, they're suffering from sleep apnea or a sleep disorder of some sort, how long um, and what is the, uh, the general kind of treatment process um, that you've seen played out that, that can 
potentially um, see these uh, an improvement in these conditions? How long is it and what is the general kind of process that people will go through? Well, the general process is really, you know, in, I always describe it as three parts. And the first part is a very thorough and comprehensive diagnosis. We need to know what it is that we're treating. So that's part one. And that diagnosis is done in conjunction with our medical colleagues 100% of the time. We're not going to start doing any you know, work until we know what it is that we're dealing with. That's part one. Part two is the most interesting part, and that's about patient compliance. It's about adherence. It's about the patient taking ownership of the healing process. So let's give an example. You know, let's say you've got a patient who's, you know, a little bit overweight, out of shape. So what you do is saying, let's get you on a nutritious diet. Let's get you eating properly, right foods in the right way at the right time. But in addition, let's get a, you know, a workout routine, exercise routine, go to the gym, get that stuff going, and then we'll check your blood pressure in, you know, three months' time. So if the patient adheres to the plan, the chances are you'll get a good outcome. If the patient wears the device as prescribed, they will probably get a good outcome. Now, when I say as prescribed, remember we're working with nature, you sleep at certain times and you're awake at certain times. And that is not a coincidence because there are different hormones that come into play when you're awake and when you're asleep. We can talk about growth hormone, we can talk about cortisol, we can talk about, um, you know, uh, the idea of melatonin and how it helps, you know, in terms of sleep. And so what we have here is a protocol saying, I'm going to mimic the natural circadian rhythm, the daytime, nighttime rhythm. And so you start wearing the device in the late afternoon, so after school, after work, after the office, that's when the device goes in. You take it out to have dinner, you brush your teeth, you pop it back in, you wear it all, you know, all during the evening and then all night long. That's about 12, 14, 16 hours, but you do not wear it during the daytime. Why is that? Well, what we know is in stage three sleep, so when you go to sleep, there are different stages. During stage three sleep, deep sleep, you start to produce growth hormone. So when a kid is growing, actually they grow when they're asleep. That's when the actual growth actually occurs. And so when you wear the device during sleep, you're going to harness the growth mechanism of the body and allow that, you know, uh, palate, the maxilla, which is the upper jaw and the lower jaw to start to grow and remodel and change ever so slightly. Now, this is a slow process, but it can take 9, 12, 18 months, depending on the case. Some cases are mild. You get them done, you know, in 9 to 12 months. Some cases are moderate and some cases are severe. I always give the idea of take 10 children at random and say run 100 yards. You know, one kid finishes first and everyone finishes later. And you can't predict typically which child is going to finish first. And so when 10 patients walk in, you're going to give them the same device, which has been customized for their needs. However, it's difficult to predict which patient is going to finish first but everyone gets there in the end. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You pace yourself, and then we know that we'll get a good result in the mid to long term. So part one is the thorough diagnosis, part two is the patient compliance, and then part three is obviously the experience and training and background and skill of the dentist or orthodontist who are actually helping the patient heal themselves. And so that kind of in a nutshell is how I would describe the, the overall process. Yeah, I, lo I love the idea of the, um, I mean, for one, patients certainly have to take this on because it, it's a difficult process. You know, everything we've described is, um, you know, amazing, but it's also, you know, changing the, the bony structures, um, you know, to to alter airway um, behaviour is, is a very complex thing to do. And so, yeah, I, I really agree that patients have to take this on, you know, as their own kind of project for it to really kind of um, to be powerful and, and to shift the physiology, but also too that everyone's different and that, you know, there, there are many different inputs and that, you know, if we can put lifestyle factors in, it really has, it really has the ability to 
um, you know, to, to help the patient in, in the broader term. And I, I've seen that so many times over. So it's great that, you know, we, we hear this whole picture coming together. Dave, you've devoted your life and you really have um, you know, really pro progressed this um, idea forward. You've written a textbook, Pneumopedics and Craniofacial Epigenics. Would you say that this is the um, every, you know, putting together all, all the information that you've, um, that, that you've culminated over, over your life and, and what, how is the process in writing that? <laughs> it's, it was a very interesting time for us because, as you know, we have just got to the other end of coming out of the pandemic. And so we had to change our work routines, office routines dramatically uh, to say, okay, now we're in lockdown position and so on and so forth. So I ended up working from home. And so typically, you know, going to a conference or a training session or all that kind of stuff was wasn't allowed, you know, every went onto virtual platform, online, so on and so forth. So all that time that I spent traveling and doing that kind of stuff, it was available to me. And so I did have the idea that my, you know, my first book on this topic was about 10 years old. And I thought now is the time to regather my thoughts, bring it up to date, encapsulate it and make it into a new book. And so that's exactly what I did. And so during the pandemic, I would spend, you know, time researching and finding new uh, papers and articles, new ideas and new data, putting it all together, trying to make it cohesive and readable. And at the end of it, you know, I came up with something which I thought was, I thought it was okay, but, you know, I'd written this in a pandemic, which is very unusual circumstances. So what I did is I sent it along to a couple of my colleagues, uh, one of which is at Stanford University in California. And I said, you know, have a look at this and what do you think? Um, and they came back to me and said, this is a pretty decent effort and we'd be happy to write the forward for the book. And so, um, you know, the professors there at Stanford University, Department of Sleep Medicine, they actually wrote the forward for the book. We kind of finalized it. We sent it off to the publishers and they said we would be happy to get this into print. And literally this week, the first copies will be uh, available for distribution. And so it's serendipity. That's the only way I can explain it, that a chunk of time became available and I was able to develop myself to this project. And I'm so glad that I did because, you know, everyone needs to have some kind of silver lining on a tough experience, a difficult experience. And I feel very fortunate and grateful that I had that chance to write this book and come out and do the side. So, you know, um, the book is really intended for uh, dental medical professionals, um, but I've written in a style that any, you know, um, interested reader with, you know, you know, some degree of education will work through this book and make sense of it. Some of it is a bit of a deep dive, but other, other parts of it are very kind of straightforward in terms of, describing what we do and how we do it and some of the results that we've got so far. So that's the kind of, in a nutshell, what the book is about. Well, Dave, after following your work for some time now and, and seeing, um, you know, in person that the level of detail and the, obviously the history that you've gone through, you know, it, it really is, it's a fascinating story, you know, starting from clefts and then moving all the way through to, you know, um, Vivos that, that is now um, a publicly listed company. You know, th this is happening on a big scale now. So it's a real testament to, um, you know, how hard and how much work you've put into this, but also to the detail that, which is what I love about, um, you know, the, especially the, this work here. It, it's very difficult to describe and you do such a good job of that. So I really recommend that um, d dental professionals or any professionals interested in this area, um, grab the book when it comes out, because it's definitely something that is going to progress this conversation in society. Dave, where can people find it? And um, if they're looking to get on a, a patient side, um, where can they be treated on this side? And where can the profession find the book? Um, the best thing would be to go to the Vivo's website, and that's vivoslife.com. And so, you know, the disclosure statement is to say that I'm the founder and chief medical officer of Vivo's Therapeutics, and their website is vivoslife.com. V I V O S L I F E dot com. And, you know, that's the way the professionals can get the book. We also have a link on Amazon, and I can send that along to you, Steve. And if you want to attach that 
then maybe people who are interested can click on that link and see the book for themselves. It sounds good. I highly recommend it. Dave, thank you so much for spending the time with us. I know you're a very busy person. And we look forward to seeing how this conversation pans out in the future. Have great. a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Eve. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.